We have a career day, and I don't think it's on the website yet, but we do have a dinner coming up in June with Jeff Sherman of Double Line. Um, but of course today we have Blair Richardson, he's going to be discussing private equity. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know Blair, um, he started out in the 80s at Goldman Sachs, moved on to Morgan Stanley. He's president of Morgan Stanley Japan, vice chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. Um, afterwards, he, he started doing private investments through B.E. Richardson Investments. Um, we did roughly 20 private investments. In addition, he helped launch a REIT in Canada, uh, TGS. After that, um, getting to, to know the community in Denver, he opened up Bow River. And so uh, we're going to have Blair discuss private equity, a few things that he's learned uh, during his years of experience, um, and focus on private equity. Blair? Is <coughs> Good afternoon. It's uh, such a pleasure. I have uh, so many friends in this room and so many people that have been involved in capital markets as long as I have, so I'm very appreciative of that. I'd like to thank Dan Katz for inviting me. Uh, Dan is an ex-Morgan Stanley guy, and I'm an ex-Morgan Stanley guy, and so we kind of hang together, and so I'm very appreciative of that. And I'd also like to thank the Colorado Society of CFAs. Um, being a CFA is something that's very important, and I want to talk about that life skill. Most of the people in the room are CFAs or CPAs, and it's a very, very important discipline. The only person who isn't is the person who's giving the address, but I'm enormously respectful of it. I want to walk through my bio a little bit because I think it will color a number of my comments. I'm going to talk to a lesser degree about private equity and give people a little bit of, particularly the younger people, advice if I may. A lot of people come to my office and they say, I'd just like to talk to you and can you mentor me? And really they're looking for a job, but I, I enjoy spending a lot of time with young people and it's part of the things I do. Um, I started the securities business uh, with Canada's oldest securities firm, a company that is not in existence today, called A. Ames & Company. It was a 100-year-old company, and I was the youngest shareholder of that company at the age of 25. I was the youngest partner of that company at the age of 28, and it was a culture of investing in a firm. At the age of 28, I had a quarter million dollar loan uh, to buy shares in that company. And I had no ability to pay that money back, but it taught me how to make risk decisions. And throughout my whole career, I believed in investing in companies you work for, and I'm gonna talk about that, and it's part of the culture at Bow River. I didn't like the Canadian securities business, it was an old boys club and I wasn't part of the old boys club, so I interviewed in New York uh, with four firms, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill, and Solomon, and I got a job offer from all four. I selected uh, Goldman Sachs, and I joined their fixed income trading area, and I was a average trader, but I ended up being a very good manager of traders across the board, and large risk positions, and I really had a sense of who was good at trading, who wasn't. And so from an average trader, which is what I would say I was, I was a very good risk manager of a lot of traders. Uh, in 1987, Russ Reynolds recruited me to join Morgan Stanley. I wasn't a partner at Goldman, but I became a partner that year at Morgan Stanley. And I ran all investment grade trading from 30 days to 30 years. And um, during that process, a gentleman by the name of John Mack became the CEO of Morgan Stanley. He took five partners and he moved them around the firm. And um, it was the best change in my life because I've been in the fixed income business for 12 or 13 years. And I got moved over to the equity side of the business. And I don't care how smart you are, there's a lot of smart people in this room. It's impossible to be completely on top of the equity business. It is so dynamic and so difficult, and it is so ever-changing. And that, from a career point of view, 
And I want to talk to young people about not being afraid to make a career change like that. I was given that opportunity and I was given a lot of support. I was put on the management committee of the equity division. 1990, they tapped me to become the president of Morgan Stanley in Japan. I was 39 years of age. And in Japan, you either made so much money you didn't know what to do with it or you made none. And I inherited a very big business that I had nothing to do with building. It had uh, 900 employees and a billion and a half of revenue. And Morgan Stanley was making 35% of all their worldwide profits out of Japan because that business was built with true Japanese professionals and it acted and looked like a, a Japanese firm and it made $350 million in 1990 and that was a lot of money in those days. I became the Vice Chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia and I, at that point they ran all risk on a geographical basis. So everything uh, from a trading point of view in Southeast Asia and Japan reported to me I flew back and forth every single week and Tokyo and Hong Kong look like they're close but they're five and a half hours and believe me and age me I did it uh, for two or three years every single week. Um, we built uh, Southeast Asia from 100 people in Hong Kong to several thousand. I joined a number of stock exchanges and traveled the world and I had a great, great experience. Uh, Basically, the conversation today is going to be about 40 years of experience in capital markets. There's a number of, of great friends here, like Jerry Paul, who've had great careers in the capital markets. And a lot of this equity risk investing mentality that I grew up with uh, is really part of Brewerver's culture. And I want to talk to people about when you get a chance to be an investor, whether you're at Janus or Aeropoint or wherever you work, Johnson Financial, I want to encourage people to take that risk and be an equity investor because it really what it makes the difference between an employee and really creating wealth. Uh, I know people who make big salaries. Wealth is made by having an equity opportunity. So I can better understand who's in the room. Maybe people can kind of give me a show of hands. Who works for banks here in this room? Okay. Who works for investment advisors? Okay. Who works for accounting and service firms? Okay. Uh, what about large businesses, public corporations, foundations? Good. And small businesses, more entrepreneurial opportunities. Great, it's very encouraging. So let me talk about uh, the CFA as a tool. And I think it's a very, very important tool. But it's only 50% of the equation, in my opinion, to be a strong person in the capital markets area and the investing area. I use the expression around Bull River, if you don't get the numbers right, you don't have anything right. It's important, it's a foundation, and people that have taken the time to get uh, their CFA or their CPA, I really credit you with it because it's a life skill, and it's an important life skill, and it's something that you will take forever. The question that I have asked by young professional all the time is Mr. Richardson or Blair, um, if you consider this a life skill and only 50% of the equation, what's the other half of the equation? And the other half of the equation is experience and judgment. And then the question quickly becomes, um, well, how do I get those very quickly? And I want to close that gap. And it's, it's not easy, but I have some ideas on how uh, you can close that gap very quickly with experience and judgment. And one of the things that causes good judgment is the first point that I made is be an equity investor. And young people come in to my office all the time and they say, um, you know, I'm going to give you 120 hours worth a week of work. I'm going to give you my complete attention and you have my commitment. And I say, I'm going to get that by just getting a job at Bow River. I want you to put your own capital in our business 
and it creates a very different culture. And I'm going to tell you some stories along my career, how that helped me uh, understand how to be a better employee and a better partner. Just at a high level, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bow River. We're going through a transformational change. Uh, we started off just as really a buyout shop in 2003. And we realized, as many people today realize, that business has to morph and change. And we had always done oil and gas, buyout, real estate, and some NASDAQ. And so today we're in uh, sort of the fifth inning of broadening out our platform. And although we've had very good buyout performance, we recently completed uh, raising an oil fund of uh, $142 million with our Canadian partners, Lex Management. And we feel our timing is just perfect. Uh, we watched all the big New York uh, firms raised six and eight billion dollar oil funds in 2014 and 15. Uh, Blackstone put 500 million dollars in Lynn Energy and Lynn Energy's taking it. So a lot of these people got in way too early. Um, the thing about broadening out the alternative space, and we really consider ourselves not as a buyout shop but as an alternative uh, manager, it gives you diverse platforms. And the beauty of private equity, and there's many people here in this room who are very good investors, the buyout space gives you long duration thought processes. And we all know Warren Buffett, one of the world's best investors, the thing he likes about Berkshire Hathaway is he doesn't have to market time. He can take long term thought processes and the alternative space and the private equity space provides that. Oil and gas, because of the commodity nature, relies a little bit more on market timing. That's a little bit more my background. Real estate also, I think we all know that the buy in real estate is made, excuse me, the money in real estate is made on the buy side, and the purchase and the exit are really critical. And MESBET, to a large degree, is really uh, a derivative of all these activities. What we like about it is it allows us to use uh, macro research. And macro research is really important because if you don't get trends right, it's like not knowing the numbers. Uh, you can just get carried away by getting macro decisions wrong. And I don't care how good of an oil man you are, it's a tough deal when oil's at $28. And it's a tougher deal when natural gas is under $2. So macro trends are very, very important. So my presentation today is really in two parts. I want to talk about my 40-year experience in the capital markets, primarily the securities business, I want to give younger people, if I may do that, some advice on how to avoid uh, pitfalls and to look at uh, what is happening in the securities business, in the investment business. And without trying to offend anyone, because I came from an investment banking background in a big bank environment, um, I think there's some very big sea changes in the face of banks today. And part of the outgrowth of that is independent RIAs and things of that nature. So in the mid 80s, up until 2008, uh, the brightest and best, excluding me, uh, came from Harvard, Stanford, the very best schools, all piled in for 25 years to Wall Street. It's a fact, Wall Street paid two, three times the compensation of what corporate America was uh, paying. And the only phenomena that was similar to that is really what we've experienced in the last 30 or 40 years in Silicon Valley in the tech side of the business. Um, I use this expression because I didn't have a Harvard MBA and I would have all kinds of Harvard MBAs reporting to me, I would say to them in the trading room, the two most overrated things in life are Harvard MBAs and extramarital sex. So you can imagine the look on their face. 
So all of this really came to a screeching halt in 2008. And I'm going to put that date as a flag in the ground uh, for what I think is going to be a 25 or 30 year change, where if you're working for a big investment bank or a big bank, you've got headwinds from a career point of view. Um, and the, the global banking business had been through a similar period, and those of us who were in the capital markets business remember that the French banking business got in trouble in the 70s, and the French government stepped in and nationalized all of those banks. And today, they act and think like utilities. Their rates of returns are 5 to 6% return on investment, and the French banks have never had the French government leave. In the 80s, the German banking system, through a structure called the Landis Bank, which was their credit union system, got in trouble. The German government privatized all of the banks, consolidated them. Banks like Westdeutsche Landes Bank, Commerce Bank, all of these banks disappeared. But the German government did something. They spun them back out into the public markets. I'm going to make the case to you today that uh, the U.S. banking system has a partner called the U.S. government, which is an 800-pound gorilla, which is not going to leave the room for the next 25 to 50 years. And it really doesn't matter whether Hillary Clinton is the president or Donald Trump. No one is going to unwind and allow the investment banks to be unfettered the, the way they were after the unwinding of the Glass-Steagall Act. And it's, uh, in my opinion, really in only the fourth or fifth inning of what the government is going to do with these big banks. And whether it's right or wrong, it's happening. The big banks uh, in this country have paid $120 billion in fines. The U.S. government uses them as a piggy bank. And this is just going to continue and continue and continue. Morgan Stanley, a firm that I know very well, just announced their earnings today. And many of you people probably are ex-Morgan Stanley or own Morgan Stanley shares. They announced their return on equity was 6.7%. Even the very best, Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein, who run Goldman Sachs, and I know them both uh, well, are struggling to hit double digits return on equity. And this sea change that was brought on by Wall Street by creating products that really had misalignment is not about to change. Recently, uh, Jamie Dimon was in town and we had a dinner uh, uh, with him and I chatted with him afterwards and he told me that at 60 Broad, which is where his head office is, there's a whole floor of regulators. And they're not about to leave. And when he used to go to Washington sort of once a quarter before 2008, he's in Washington every three weeks. And it's just a continuum. So, for those of you that are considering going into uh, uh, big investment banks, I will tell you that I think the headwinds are going to be there for a long time. I'm not going to defend what Wall Street did. If you look at the structure that Wall Street created, it was created with absolute misalignment. You had this investment banking division that created products, brought in IPO, bond underwritings. You had the sales and trading side that was compensated by distributing those products. And then you had this class called research. And if people are senior enough at investment banking firms, they know that research is paid for by both the investment banking arm and the sales and trading arm. So imagine that conflict of interest, that misalignment. So uh, I see uh, the headwinds for investment banks to be 
uh, significant. I see them to be long dated. And I don't think the 800 pound gorilla, which is called the federal government, is about to leave the room for a long time. So what has happened as a result of this is something very exciting. And there's a number of you in this room that are involved in this. The fastest growing area in the capital markets over the last seven years is private RIAs. And people are leaving large investment banking firms, forming their own RIAs. Dan is a perfect example of that. Left Morgan Stanley, had a very substantial current Morgan Stanley. And what is so attractive about the RIA model is you sit on the same side of the table as your client. You charge a fee, and you get to pick that product, that product, or that product, and you don't get forced to sell firm products. And I know all the majors claim that they're not selling firm products, but these doors can't stay open without selling firm products. The other thing that the small private RIAs are doing is they're providing family planning, tax consulting, and this is, in my opinion, an area that is as important as rates of return. So if you, as a small IRA or asset manager, provide this skill set to your customers, it prevents uh, people from leaving you and I think makes you a very sticky relationship with your clients. Imagine working with my kids and developing a relationship versus my kids working with Northern Trust or Goldman Sachs becomes a personal relationship and it becomes generational um, in many respects. So let me talk a little bit about the private equity business which I'm in and why we like the business and uh, some of the things that I see as future changes. I mentioned to you that we were a one-dimensional operation. We uh, just did really buyout, and I looked at that, and it's a, sun, it's a fun and exciting space, but you have a 10-year life cycle. And so recently we went off uh, and decided to branch out into other areas that we had done previously, and those areas were oil and gas, real estate, and mess together. And what I like about them is I've been through cycles, and trees don't go to heaven forever. Although the bio space is attractive and sexy, and everyone wants to be involved in it, that can go through cycles. And many people in this room have been through a number of cycles. So the fact that Bow River is diversifying its platform base to four distinct silos that have different maturity patterns is really a method to create a sustainable firm, a long-dated firm, and most importantly, a private-owned firm by our employees. And it goes back to that thought that I mentioned in the beginning. I'm a big believer in investing in the business that you work in. And I'm also a big believer in taking on debt to invest in those businesses. Don't take debt on to buy a BMW car, or don't take debt on to go to a holiday in Mexico, but take debt on if you get an opportunity to invest in your asset management firm, in your business, or in your private equity shop. Because the number one rule is, you're watching the kitchen, you're making the soup, you're investing in yourself. And so people shouldn't have trepidation about investing in businesses they do. So what do we find exciting about the alternative class that we're in? In the 1980s, most people would recommend that only 1% to 3% of your assets be in alternatives. It was a new area. It was very illiquid. Today, that has grown 10 times. Uh, most people, depending on the type of institution, I see we have foundations in the room and other uh, endowments, suggest that you should have up to 30% of your assets in these alternative classes. And why is that? Because if it performs correctly and you select the right managers, it produces 
five to six hundred basis points of IRR above liquid markets. And it needs to do that because these are five, seven, ten year investments. But everyone in this room is mathematical and everyone understands the impact of an investment that produces five or six hundred IRR, not straight line simple interest above liquidity. And that's what makes alternatives so attractive. So we have a business in the buyout space, and I want to talk about that, that really is aligned with small businesses in America. We all read the Wall Street Journal and we talk about General Motors or GE or Apple. They're only 17% of the American economy. 83% of the American economy is made up of small businesses that have less than 500 people. So private equity in the lower middle market space that we're in, we interface with lower middle America every day. And it's very interesting how these <clears throat> entrepreneurial people have created really significant value added. And I find how they intellectualize their businesses really interesting. And it varies along the way. So we like being aligned with a large macro market called the US economy. We like having the luxury of literally thinking in five, seven, and ten year horizons. And although certain uh, platforms that we're involved in, oil and gas and real estate, have timing to them, the buyout space really doesn't have, it has cycles and other things, it doesn't have the buy uh, and the sell that commodities and real estate have. So we also feel that we're important to the American economy and we feel what we do aligns ourselves very much with um, our LP's interest. And we honestly believe that if we do our job correctly, that uh, we produce superior rates of returns for our LPs. And I'm going to touch upon Bull River's returns, and I'm very proud of them. Now, uh, what makes the private, e private equity business an interesting business from our side, meaning the general partner or the management operation? And I keep telling. Uh, my young guys, uh, this is a very, very attractive model. One, you have long dated management fees. I mean, most people in this room have management fees that are 30 days in duration, and you're as good as your last quarter. The private equity business has management fees of seven to 10 years. That's very powerful. Also, there's very few businesses that offer a success fee at the end of the exit. And that's the 80-20 split, where your, your LPs get all their proceeds back, plus a prep rate. And you, as a management company, as a GP, participate in the economics of an 80-20. Basically, the management fee that promote, if you will, at the end, is also tax efficient. And although I'm the beneficiary of that, it's treated as long-term capital gains, I personally believe that that is not going to survive. If you've heard Hillary speak about this, she won't defend it. And even Donald Trump, who's promoted everyone his whole life, isn't standing behind that. So the PE space is a very competitive space. You have to be a proactive person in that. You have to be a self-starter. Um, but it's got a lot of exciting aspects. Imagine buying and selling companies, working with lower middle America, uh, listening to their stories, working with them in transition to the next generation, and really feel like you are improving their situation and their company, and we try to do that at every single point. The type of person who succeeds in private equity is someone who's a, a curious mind, someone who's a significant reader, someone who understands macro trends, someone who has a mind that says, 
let's do it this way, let's think out of the box, and someone who has networking skills and sales skills, because you are always selling. You're selling to that small company and saying, come with Bow River, we can do this and this for you. You're selling that company five to seven years later. It's very important that you do that. And you also are selling to your LPs because this is the biggest trust that takes place in the capital markets because your LPs are partners with you for seven or 10 years. And if you at any single hedge fund or mutual fund, um, you could be out of that investment in a year or you could be out of that in 30 days. And this is a long-term lockup and you have to be able to convince people that one, you have a sustainable model and a model that really serves their interest. So just quickly, I'll go over our uh, IRRs. Our 2003 fund has been completely returned. It's an 11.5% IRR. Our 2000, these are net. Our 2007 fund that I'm the most proud of, it's a 14 net IRR. Our 2011 fund is a 24% IRR. And a 24% IRR in our 11 fund puts us in the top 5% of the 5,600 funds in the country that do this. And what I'm most proud of is the staircase. Uh, 11 and a half, 14, 24. So maybe not me, but people at Bow River are clearly getting better at what we're doing. And I'm very proud of that. So now let me turn to the question that um, a lot of young people ask me all the time. If my assumption is correct that being a CFA or a CPA is 50% of this game, and the next 50% comes in experience and in judgment, how do you get those two other components? And I would just like to uh, throw out some, some concepts that I think are, are very important. You should work for organizations where you respect the people at the top where you want to be involved with people at the top, and these people are leaders, they're smart, and they're good risk takers. And if you're at a company today where you don't ex uh, respect the people at the top, get out of Dodge, lead and change. And I'll tell you a story about wealth creation and taking risk. In 1987, uh, on October 19th, the stock market was down, the Dow was down 23%. That's like the Dow today going from 17.9 to 13.4 in one day. Things were very, very bleak on Wall Street. And most of Wall Street at the partner level was paid 10% stock. I was a partner, I was the juniorest partner there and 90% cash comp. And the management team at Morgan Stanley, Dick Fisher and John Mack, who I respected a lot, came to the partners, and there were only 42 of us. Morgan Stanley was tiny then, we were under 4,000 people, and said, we're going to give you an option where you can take 60% stock and 40% salary. <coughs> So I looked at it and I talked to all my junior partners. I said, what are you guys on? This is a risk trade. And they said, we're not doing that deal. And matter of fact, we're gonna even sell Morgan Stanley stock. I watched the guys at the top of Morgan Stanley who I had unbelievable respect for. And they went even further than that. They took, and they were wealthy guys, but they took 10% cash cop and 9% stock. I went home and said to my wife, you know what, I'm going with that program. I'm going to do that. And I said, oh, for God's sakes, we can't even live on our salary. What are you doing here? And I did that. And Morgan Stanley went from $19 to $120 over the next eight years. And that's an example of being in a risk-based culture and focusing on your own business. And when the people at the top of whatever company you're with have strong leadership, 
and strong thoughts, then you want to be around them. Also work in a culture that embraces millennials and young thinking. We're a tiny little firm. We're 13 people. Half of them are millennials. And millennials are teaching me and they're teaching the senior partners because they're able to do things in such an effective manner so rapidly. And this is one of the things <coughs> that you should look at in the firm that you're considering working with and joining. Also, look at whether the firm you're with has a long-term vision. And I just told you we at Bull River have changed our sales. I didn't like the dimension of one product. I didn't like the possibility that the firm wouldn't be sustainable. But we've got an organization that is going to sell the ownership to the key people, so it's always going to be employee-owned. And that's very, very important. Also, continually evaluate your organization and continually evaluate the role you're in. The average millennial will have seven jobs in their life and five careers, and we all know this, and two of those careers haven't even been thought of today. 20 years ago, if I would held up a cell phone and said, this is the ultimate game changer, most of the people in the room wouldn't know what I was holding up. And these are the dynamics that people are faced with. And I also want to encourage people to make sure that you have a career path and a long-term career path. So when people say to me, you know, how do I shorten that judgment? How do I shorten that experience? I always say to them, uh, you are a product of your background. I've been a product of taking risk in businesses that I invest in for a long time. I started a shareholder at 25, youngest partner in the oldest Canadian firm at 28, doubling down at Morgan Stanley, investing all the way through. And that's because I was a loyal employee, but I was always looking at the organization. And are these guys at the top of these organizations the type of people I want to emulate with and be part of? So also make sure that you are in a company that appreciates young thinking and appreciates thinking outside of the box. If you're in a company where if you get continually uh, pushed back from senior people and people look at it, you know, how long I've contributed versus what I've contributed to, you may not be with the right type of company. So work in a company that has uh, growth, work in a company that embraces young people, work in a company that supports young people. Also, young people can close this experience gap so quickly with big data. Use big data all the time. Be a massive reader. I spend every Saturday, either down at my cigar club or whatever, I read every single thing that I've missed. It's a discipline, and it keeps you on top of your game, and it's very, very valuable. Continue to think outside of the box. It's very important, and accept criticism openly, because everyone has made mistakes, and God knows I've made a long laundry list of them through my life. But I use an expression that if you repeat your mistakes, you're going to go bankrupt. And no one at Bull River has ever been fired for making a mistake because I think it is the very best way to learn. The other point I would make uh, to close this experience gap <laughs> is network continually. Be members of associations like this. Join Children's Hospital, Colorado Uplift, the Humane Society, the Denver Public School System, the Boys and Girls Club, I'm just picking these at random. And the reason to do this is people look at you in a completely different light when you're giving what I call one of the three W's. Your work, and every young person in this room can give their work, their wisdom, and you don't have to necessarily write a check. 
It's, it's part of the culture by networking, but get involved in not-for-profits, get involved in political associations, because people see you in a very different light. And then when you approach them from a business point of view with an idea, they've seen you in a different light, and they've seen you really what I consider in the very best light. So with that, I'd be pleased to take any questions. Uh, I hope, I, I think uh, Dan told me I could give a little bit of advice, and uh, I didn't want to talk about Bow River from really a marketing point of view, and I wanted to focus on those. So I'd be pleased to answer any questions, um, and uh, thank you. Come on, Jerry, you must have something for me. You know, I I'm waiting for uh, those young guys back there that you know, said they knew more than their boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Big firms versus small firms. Can the small firms in this space do what the big firms do now because of big data and things of that nature? Yeah, uh, the, the qu it's a good question. Uh, can small firms survive um, versus big firms and, and the <laughs> question is, because of big data, can that happen? I believe so, because there's so many layers at various cost structures of supplying big data, but there, there's no question it's a big expense for a small business. You, your technology spend, I mean, your real estate, your, your, your compensation of your personnel is number one, your real estate, and then it's data, and it's a big driver. But if you're committed to that, I think there's enough outlets that are cost efficient that allow you to do that. Blair, when you when you are making investments in these small and medium sized companies, is there a consistent uh, need that they have that you and other private equity investors provide? You know that you know, sometimes it's capital, sometimes it's expertise, and maybe it's always just different. So the question is, uh, in the buyout space, in, in, in the private equity side, is there a common theme that these people are looking for? And, and I would say uh, generally yes, uh, but what we do is we sit down before we close a transaction and we bring a facilitator in and we do an off-site gathering and we say to them, this is what you can count on us doing. Uh, don't count on us doing any of the following. So we have a clear meeting of minds that we're going to provide uh, corporate governances, corporate minutes, all of the banking, all of the financial. We're going to help them drop their strategic plan, a one and a three year plan. And we're not going to micromanage it and we also have real procedures, Jerry, where we speak to these companies for an hour once a week. We don't just phone them up on Monday and say, how did the Broncos game go? These guys are running the business. And so they report during that call, and every three weeks, they're in Denver. We have a face-to-face, -face. we usually have a dinner, or we're down in Houston, and so there's this daily interchange. We're very hands-on. But to answer your question, we tell them exactly what we do, and we don't do these other things. And you can understand that. We've been in 34 different companies, maybe too many. We've been all the way from cremation to industrial boilers. And the guy running the industrial boiler company or the cremation company has forgot more than we're ever going to provide, right? So I would say uh, what they really look for us uh, to provide is sort of taking them from a lifestyle company to sort of the next level, bringing proper governance, proper pr governance meaning, you know, getting an org chart, filling that out, executing against that, um, you know, holding them accountable if they're going to add, you know, sales and distribution, if they're going to add new products and things of that nature. Um, and it's really a partnership. You know, all of these investments haven't worked for us. Four of them, we've lost everything out of 34, which is a pretty low record. But none of those have ever ended up in litigation. I'm very proud of that. We've stayed in the boardroom and worked through it. So 
It's primarily the capital market skills that you would expect us to provide, and that's what they're really looking for. You mentioned the, the governmental regulation on the big banks and how that's causing them to be utilities. How do you, how do you view governmental regulation impacting the private equity business and the returns going forward? I mean, due to all the, you know, the burdens. I'm, uh, I, I'm quite concerned. And, um, you know, Abe, who I was very constructive when, uh, of when he first became leader in Japan, Keep in mind, they've had 48 leaders since the Second World War in Japan. Uh, no one's been able to really accomplish anything. Um, it, it's a company that's a, uh, it's a country that's enormously wealthy, but it just doesn't work. Yes? From your biography, you've lived and worked in most of the major money centers of the world, but you're based here in Colorado. I'm just kind of curious about your sense of the pros and cons of this as a financial center. Um, when I moved here, we were the you know, fifth largest financial center in the country because Janus was at that point 300 billion and there were a number of other, and we've declined, um, uh, and I think we're 11th or 12th, um, but, you know, Denver just has so much going for it. It's, uh, it's incredible, the inbound immigration. Uh, just the electricity on the street. Um, it's really exciting. And DIA, and I know people uh, who were opposed to DIA, they were completely wrong. DIA puts through 58 million passengers a year. The thing is in a huge surplus. I was the chairman of the investment committee for the city and county of Denver for a number of years. And the cash build up to retire those bonds, it's been a huge success. So. With technology and with the flights out of DIA, you can get anywhere. So I think it's a great place uh, to have a, a financial service business because it's a great lifestyle. And I like the fact that we have a Western culture. You know, people wear suits and cowboy boots. I, I love and respect that. That's part of our deal. So I'm very constructive on it. I love New York. I love home. I know these markets well, but we've got something special going on here. I'm uh, really intrigued by what you're saying about uh, trying to create sustainability of Bone River Capital and like having a business that will is is more than just you know like, <coughs> the last buyout fund. And but I'm wondering just if you can maybe ex expound on that a little bit more because I think a lot of small investment managers are kind of run in such a way that it's it's for the, the senior partner and the founder, and then you know once they go away, it's it's hard to keep the sustainability of that firm going. And so. Wondering if you wouldn't mind uh, maybe expounding a little bit more about your uh, thoughts on that. Well, I'm I'm very blessed. I've got a lot of jelly beans in my own personal jar, and so about 18 months ago, I looked at whether I want to spend my time with my four kids, who are all in various forms of business, um, or I wanted to change Bow River, and um, I went to two lifetime mentors, and everyone should have a mentor. One of them is a Canadian billionaire who uh, is 80 and he said, oh, oh, forget it, just you know, wind up Bow River and focus with your kids. And then I went to someone whose board I was on, talking about being boards. He was Greystone Capital and he built an asset management firm in Canada that's 38 billion. And he said, you know what, um, you focus and grow Bow River. Uh, I, I know you as a person, I know how much you enjoy those professionals. Uh, there and how you want to create sustainability and you know a, uh, a law firm here um, in Denver uh, that we all know very well and the two senior partners are good friends of mine Norm Brownstein and Steve Farber that thing would have collapsed for certain uh, Norm 72 Steve is 71 um, but what they did is they acquired a California water, a water firm, they uh, acquired a Nevada gaming firm, and they brought the next level of management along, like Adam Hager and people like that. And that firm will survive uh, a long time after Norm and Steve, who aren't leaving tomorrow, they can't even find the law library, but they're very good at what they do, because they did long-term planning. 
And so they made the commitment. And so it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's what are important issues to you personally. And I decided this was an important issue to me. And so we're halfway through executing our strategic plan and we will execute it all and we'll have sustainability and I will sell uh, parts to various people at the firm. I'm financing it and, and the first round I'll finance it. Next round they'll have to go to the bank. But we'll have sustainability. And again, I keep making this point. Think of the culture that I grew up in. I grew up in an equity culture where, you know, people were asked to buy shares and they were rewarded for it. And it worked, right? So I'm a big believer in that. Anyways, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I just want to, uh, uh, Byron Ween, who's 80 years of age uh, and the vice chairman of Blackstone, was a partner of mine. And each year he produces uh, the 10 most likely events that people uh, don't think are going to occur. But he recently put out life's lessons, and I, I would like everyone to email me and get a copy of them. And they're up here on this screen. Uh, and I just want to highlight, and, and I, I, I emailed Byron over the weekend, and I said, Byron, can I use these? And he said, uh, leave the part out that when you're 80, you have to sleep uh, 10 hours a day, and then go ahead and use them. <laughs> but um, the, his number one point is network intensely. If people want to close this experience gap, do that. His number four point is when you meet a new person, treat them as a friend. His number five point, and I know Byron really well, and he comes through Denver, and from time to time I take him out to dinner, you guys would enjoy it, uh, is read intensely and read all the time. His uh, number 11 point, and young people have to understand this, when someone does something that is really distinguishing, write them a handwritten letter. Don't send them an email. People email all day, it's cheap. Take the time to write a handwritten letter. And I think that's something that's very important. And then, which is my philosophy, is 16th point, never retire. Anyways, thank you. <laughs> that has hubris, uh, and, and you have hubris uh, in, um, in the private equity world today. Some of these uh, larger private equity firms, Blackstone, Carlisle, uh, these guys are not millionaires, but they're billionaires. And a lot of them know Jamie Dimon and Roy Blank Find, and these guys are, are at the private equity shops are worth eight to ten times. And Jamie Dimon is as good as banker uh, as there ever has been. And I traded commodities against Lloyd Blankfein, so I know Lloyd reasonably well, and he's a good banker. And it goes to the point, they happen to be in the wrong chair, uh, uh, you know, at the wrong time, and they're facing substantial headwinds. So I think there's going to be pressure on private equity and uh, one of the things that Warren Buffett's pushing very hard on, and I couldn't defend it, is uh, why is this promote where the GP doesn't have one dollar in the promote treated as capital gains? And the reason Warren Buffett is driving that issue is he competes every day against KKR, Blackstone for companies, and they have an advantage. And believe me, Warren has Hillary's ear. And that uh, is going to, in my opinion, not continue. And even if you know, I'm the beneficiary of it, I personally don't think it's right. Uh, so I think there are headwinds for private equity, but I, it, it's such a small silo compared to uh, the banking industry that it just doesn't get the spotlight that it should. And it really doesn't really have systemic risk. If you look at, at uh, the big banks today, they're bigger than the crisis, right? I mean, this, and we all read the Wall Street Journal last week where 
they had to submit what are called living wills, where simply the regulators could unplug, you know, J.P. Morgan or Citibank or Bank of America if they got in trouble. I, I can tell you, you can't unplug any of those institutions. You've got another systemic problem again. They've just got larger, right? They've got quite a bit larger. I mean, Lehman was only 1.1 uh, 1 trillion, and I think J.P. Morgan's 2 trillion today, right? So they, the bigger have got bigger, and so the risk is, is there. Uh, private equity, uh, I think the 80-20 promote from a tax point of view is gone. Please. As a smaller firm, uh, how and where do you find your limited partners? Well, uh, we've been uh, very blessed. We, we really have uh, high net worth individuals, uh, small endowments, uh, RIAs are big investors with us, um, small little foundations, sort of three to five hundred million of assets, of family offices. Um, someone like this CalPERS isn't going to be an investor in us. Quite honestly, I've dealt with that type of institution my whole life, and I don't want them to be an investor with us. Uh, I don't want to spend all my time with their lawyers. So th that's our source of funds. Yes. What's your perspective on investing in Canada now? Um, it, it's it's interesting because, as you can see, I'm a I'm a Canadian. Um, uh, Canada's got a lot of headwinds, and particularly Alberta's got a lot of problems. Uh, no Keystone Pipeline, and it is an oil economy, um, and. If you look at no access to markets with no Keystone Pipeline, you then drop to natural gas. And natural gas, as we know, at under $2, uh, there, there's no rate of return. So Alberta, which has been a huge engine for a long time, because they are like Texas, um, is, is really going to have some uh, really difficult times ahead here. Uh, the counterbalance to that is uh, the rest of Canada is a manufacturing economy, particularly uh, Ontario to a lesser degree Quebec. And with the Canadian dollar at sort of a 130 discount, it makes uh, Canadian products uh, very competitive. Um, I, I, I don't have a, a strong view. I own a number of things in Canada personally. I think the very best market is the U.S. market. Selectively, I think there's things that are attractive in Canada, but uh, I like all kinds of opportunities here. And I just spent uh, 10 days in Europe, and I have a very strong view about Europe. I think Europe's got huge, huge problems. I went to Croatia, and the unemployment rate <coughs> is 13%. There were 55,000 Syrian people held in an internment camp. And I basically believe that Europe remembers, uh, and you probably remember, uh, the Turkish-Greek uh, war where uh, 2.6 million people left Cyprus and took all of the jobs throughout Europe. And that's exactly the, is what is happening with Syria. These refugees are everywhere. Uh, this is a very slow growth economy other than Germany with a lot of problems. And to me, it looks like a lot of the terrorist activities that were taking place in the Middle East are now shifting to Europe. So I am not uh, sanguine at all on Europe, uh, and I don't have any investments in Europe. Given your focus on the macro and your focus on oil and gas, what do you think of uh, oil prices, gas prices, and who do you listen to on the street with regard to those uh, commodities? Well, uh, we're very blessed, uh, and many guys know him, and he's the real deal. We have Tom Petrie living here in Denver, and when Tom was at Credit Suisse First Boston, he's the managing partner of, of uh, Petrie uh, and Company. Um, when he was on Wall Street for 10 years, four or five of those years, he was the number one rated oil analyst, and Tom has a real handle on it. Tom understands it, um, and he was quoted the other day saying that uh, we're in the fourth or fifth inning only uh, of a recovery. 
when uh, the Saudis decided in uh, Thanksgiving weekend of 14 to keep the tap on, and we were $104 oil. Uh, and then the announcement came out, and we gapped down $8 next Monday. The following weekend, I read the five oil corrections going back to 80 uh, period. And the average duration of these corrections is 42 months, and it's even longer than that because, as you recall, in the 2000 and 2009 period, we came from 128 to 38, and then we're back up to normal pricing. So if you normalize that V, which was about 19 months, you're more like 50 months. So uh, here we are, sort of barely 24 months in it. It's going to be a, a long grind here. And uh, we have so much gas. The only area that we're playing in is oil. Uh, 15 years ago, there was 80 years of gas supply in this country. Today there's 120, and serious people in the oil and gas business tell you there's going to be 160 years of natural gas supply out there. So uh, I'm not constructive at all in gas. I think it's a, uh, it's a long, flat curve. It's good for American manufacturing because you can build plants with 10-year gas under $3.50 and, and lock in those types of rates. Um, but I think it's uh, lower, longer, and I would focus on Tom Petrie. And as you, um, also the other firm that I watch is, I think Citibank has an excellent commodity guy, and I'm, I'm, I can't remember his name. Morse. I'm sorry? Morse? Yes. Yeah. And so those are, you know, it, it, it's when you read a lot and follow it, you, you got to try and separate the wheat from the chaff and follow people that are good. So I look at Petrie and I, I like City Bank stuff. What are your thoughts on Japan having lived there and <clears throat> kind of their future? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm negative on, on Japan. Um, and it brings it back why I'm positive on investing in this country. Um, there, again, lessons learned. Um, the Japanese never flushed their system. They never declared bankruptcies and got rid of the problems. And when I was over there as the president of Morgan Stanley Japan, we had a small bank. And it was very small, like 100 million. And we did it through relationships with these various kretsus. And in 1992, one of our small loans got in trouble, and the various banks came to us and said, oh, oh, just forgive this and roll this out. And we exited that bank after those conversations, because I quickly figured out what the club was like in Japan, and I didn't like it. And what we do in the United States, which is painful and so good, is we cause bankruptcies, and we get rid of the weak. We flush the system, and Japan never does that. Um, I'm very concerned, um, you know, the aging demographics, the, the Japanese culture, which I know and respect a lot, is the purest culture in the world. They will not allow any immigrants into that country. And they're even, Switzerland is like that, but Switzerland's only tiny, right? There's 128 million Japanese. If you undress a Korean man and a Japanese man and stood them naked side by side, you couldn't tell the difference between the two. But they've been battling each other for 600 years and boiling each other in oil. And Japan will turn out the lights and sink that island before they allow immigration. And they need growth. And as you know, it's an aging demographics. It's a, probably a healthcare nightmare.